everyone. I'm Dan Langley and welcome to the latest episode of the Manufacturing IT Podcast. I'm joined today by John Broadbent. John is the founder of Realized Potential, uh, labeled as an Industry 4.0 Educator, Smart Factory Specialists. Uh, John and I have been connected for some years now on LinkedIn. I've seen some of the great content he produces. So delighted he's joined me on the podcast. Uh, welcome, John. Thank you, Daniel, once again for the opportunity. Um, my pleasure, John. So, um, yeah, please, we, I've, I've known you for a little while on LinkedIn. We, we've had some good chats. So, so look, please tell everyone about yourself. Um, I realised yesterday this, this is my 47th year in Australian manufacturing, <laughs> so I've been, doing it, I've, I've been doing it for a while and thankfully still have a passion for what I do. Um, I, I started Realised Potential in 2017 specifically to address what I saw was a shortfall in the market for agnostic Industry 4.0 education. Lots of people out there were trying to sell their stuff. I have nothing to sell other than my time and experience. And I spent sort of 2018, 19 investing heavily in LinkedIn through some proper education to establish Realized Potential as a brand. And as you said, then through 20 sort of 2021, I decided to put together a video series. I think it's up to episode 13. I've been a bit lazy the last few months, but I'm, I've got another episode brewing. So uh, I'll get back into the back into the video room and start recording another episode soon, I think. No, that's great, John. And I'll, I'll put a link to the uh, videos in the comments when we share this episode because um, they, they are really great videos and uh, kudos to you on that front. Thank you. Short and sweet. Um, yeah. So, so, John, tell us a little bit about what Industry 4.0 means to you. You know, obviously it's a buzzword right now. Everybody's talking about it. So, so what does it mean to you and kind of what have you seen change as we kind of move towards more Industry 4.0 adoption? So for me, when I first heard about Industry 4.0, I didn't know what it was. I realized then looking at it, there was lots of confusion in the marketplace. So just after Realized Potential was born, I set about trying to understand and clarify what it really was and, and came to the conclusion, and there's various schools of thought, but for me, um, it's really the convergence of three very specific paradigms. One is what are known as cyber physical systems. So for anybody who doesn't know what that is, the dashboard in your car is a cyber physical system. It takes you know, thousands of signals from your car and the engine management system and presents it to you in a fairly simplified form. <laughs> Usually how fast you're going, how much fuel you got, <laughs> and your temperature gauge, that's about it. Um, so it, the cyber physical systems are anything with which we interact as humans in the cyber world. So in a manufacturing sense, it's the typical SCADA HMI type displays that we would see in that environment. And there's been obviously an emergence of that over the last 25 to 30 years. I first started using SCADA, I think, in early 91. Um, and built factories during the 90s in Southeast Asia for an Australian building company who was making factories to make stuff uh, and got to use extensive amounts of SCADA and, and DCS style stuff during that time. So they were what would be considered cyber physical systems. The second underpinning pillar, if you like, of Industry 4 is I realize is the network and cloud. So the ability to network all this stuff and have access to cloud computing. I mean, cloud computing has become so ubiquitous. You and I are talking here today on through some <laughs> cloud-based <laughs> you know, server that Zoom have somewhere mm -hmm. in the amorphous cloud. And the third leg is the industrial internet of things, which is obviously all the things that you find in a factory from which we can collect information like robots, you know, way bridges, scales, SCADA systems, PLCs, pretty well anything that's got usually an IP address from which we can extract information. So because of, in my view, the synergy is greater than the parts that, you know, okay, you've got cyber physical systems and okay, you've got cloud network and okay, you've got IOT, but when you bring those together, the convergence of those three, the synergies of that suddenly give us, in my view, previously unprecedented opportunities not only get to get access to information, but to abstract that information, put it somewhere where we can use it, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, and mash that up into a way that we've never been able to do before, and therefore get more real-time information about what's really going on in the business. Yeah. So that's what I see fundamentally as the opportunity. I mean, that's and, really... Oh, sorry, go on, John. Yeah, and, and what we've seen as an emergence of that is that now that Industry 4.0 is over a decade old, we now are very clear about the four levels of maturity that a business goes through. And one of the bits of misinformation that I've seen out there, where I guess misunderstandings that's generally at play is that manufacturers 
seem to think that industry four is an all or nothing approach. And I'm just going to take you through a brief example to show you that it's not, which I think will be, I did a, a keynote two days ago that landed really well. And I, sure. I spoke about this and pe people in the room were like, oh, thank you for clarifying that. Um, the first part of industry four maturity, well, to, to start industry four maturity and take advantage of the cyber physical systems, network cloud and IOT, we have to close out industry 3.0, which was all about computerization and connectivity. Yeah. So it's okay to have a piece of kit on the factory floor with a SCADA system on it uh, and a PLC inside of it. But unless you can get access to it and abstract that information somewhere else and do something with it, it's pretty useless. You've still got to go down to the factory floor to see what the hell's going on. And you often find those factories are still very Excel uh, spreadsheet and paper heavy. <laughs> yeah. If we look at the four levels of maturity in Industry 4, the first level is the seeing level. So again, dashboard in your car, you can now see how fast you're going, whoop de doo um, I'm doing 60 kilometers an hour, but that really tells me nothing until I get to level two of the maturity path, which is then all about the understanding. So it's then putting that data into context. So I'm traveling down the road doing 60 kilometers an hour, that's my speedo, but I look outside and I've got an external reference and I now see I'm in either a 40 kilometer an hour school zone or I'm on 110 kilometer an hour uh, motorway Either way, I'm in trouble, but for different reasons. Yeah. Um, and then we can go to the third level of, of Industry 4, which is the predictability piece. It says, well, based on what I now know, I've now got context. I'm doing 60 in a school zone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm predicting I'm going to get a ticket. Um, yeah. So I'm now able to adjust my speed accordingly, um, which is the third level of maturity. And the fourth level is then the ability to adapt and optimize. And we're finding, for example, that modern cars can read advisory signs um, and automatically change the speed of the car yeah. when you come into a different speed zone so you don't get booked, for example. Um, so that's an example of how cars are doing it. But in a more practical example in a factory, anybody in the food and beverage industry or FMCG um, industry itself or sector itself, there are often check weighers sitting at the end of the line measuring weights of product and they do overweights and underweights. They sit local and that's it. Hmm. They're usually computerized, but they may not be connected to a network. So if we can connect that device like a check weigher to a network and then again, abstract that information and take it somewhere else, we can now see remotely what that check weigher is doing. And some of the systems out there allow you to collect every individual pack weight. Yeah. You can put that into a database away from the check wire, so you can now do something with it like an SPC analysis of is my filling process um, in control. If we can then level one, I can now see remotely what my check wire is doing. Level two would be, well, what's the weight supposed to be? So I'm going to go to a manufacturing execution system or an ERP system or a manufacturing order and get the standard weight for that. So I've now got context. Yes. And, and I could now plot that on an SPC chart as the upper and lower control limits, you know, for example. Level three then says, well, I now know what I'm doing. I'm now collecting an SPC chart and I'm seeing several values heading north towards the upper control limit. And I'm about to make predict I'm about to make out of specification product. Yes. Based on that, I tell yes. someone who cares, they go to the filler and they make an adjustment. Level four is you know the bee's knees because that's where we eventually close the loop where the control system gets the weight looks at the standard does the spc or some other analysis and says we're about to make out of spec product but then automatically adjusts the filling process to um, stop that event from happening so it's adapting and optimizing in a closed loop environment to stop um, out of out of spec product so that's industry four in a nutshell applied at simply an, an individual asset. I think that's a really nice example there, John. And I really like the analogy with the kind of food packaging because it really resonates. And I guess it, it makes a lot of sense across those four different layers. So I appreciate that. So obviously you're based in you're based in Australia and, and you know, you mentioned that, you know, your geographic region is Australia, New Zealand. Are you seeing a certain trend across different industry verticals who are faster to adopt to industry 4.0 or at least uh, more mature on this journey i know you mentioned automotive there in an analogy and, and food but are they the key industries that you're seeing or was that just uh <laughs> examples that came to mind we don't have an automotive industry anymore okay 
<laughs> we made a we made a policy decision several years ago um, that rocked our manufacturing economy. We lost eighty thousand upstream and downstream jobs. We now only oh. assemble, sadly. Okay. Um, food and beverage seems to be the area, but I would have to say there are some quite large public companies and multinationals that haven't got a clue about Industry 4.0 and digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding it's not so much the sector, it's more, I'd have to say three things that if you wanted to look for an organisation that was in the sweet spot to do this transformation first, um, the first is the video that you spoke about earlier, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. The second is where they sit on what's known as the social science construct, which is the law of diffusion of innovation of an idea. It's how an idea travels through society and where are you on that continuum? Are you at the bleeding edge or are you the, the skeptic at the back that's saying it's never going to happen or somewhere in between? And ironically enough, there's another uh, construct called the hierarchy of competence. And I'll start at the beginning. Um, as you mentioned, there's an episode. <laughs> Sorry? No, I said, please do. I'm really fascinated by this now. <laughs> so if you imagine um, when you've seen episode six, it ain't about the platform. And that came about because I was noticing manufacturers unwillingness to invest in platforms, in solutions, irrespective of the organization that was, you know, peddling their silver bullet. Um, and I could hear them whinging at me going, you know, can you help us sell this? Can you help us sell that? Well, no, um, but let's have a look at what the problem is. And that video came about from trying to articulate that frustration. And in there, I talk about a seven question elimination process. First one, do you want to be best in class? Mm -hmm. Companies, for some reason, don't seem to ask that question, which I thought was a bit strange. If you do, do you know what it looks like? I deal with lots of organizations where the people inside the four walls have been there for long periods of time and they get very myopic and only know what they know and they don't go out and join best practice networks or go see what other manufacturers do because they're the best and we're world class. Well, guess what? You're not. Yeah. Um, the third question I think was, um, do you then have a leadership committed to supporting digital transformation? Mm. Um, at that keynote a couple of days ago, I made the point that digital transformation is led from the top and action from the bottom. Yes. If you try and take action from the bottom with ideas and pilots, you'll get stuck in pilot purgatory because you'll never get the executive leadership buy-in. And if you start at the top without the knowledge and experience, it's just a great idea that never sees the light of day. So you actually need both, but you need the commitment at the executive level first, at the leadership level to go, we're committed to digital transformation. We understand it's a three to five year journey. It's not gonna happen overnight, but that's the direction we're going in. So let's all row in the same, in the same direction. The fourth one there was then, do you, um, have you done any analysis on what might be your low hanging fruit? Do you have the resources, money, time, experience? Do you need to get outside help? And finally, when you've got all your ducks in a row and you know what you can do, how you can do um, and, and where you might want to do it, and you've done some maybe um, return on investment on, uh, calculations or at least estimates, then you might go to market and choose a vendor or a partner or an integrator to do a, a proof of value pilot, not a proof of concept. Mm. So, John, I was, I was so, so, sorry, go ahead, Gordon. You can you go. That point. There you go. No, I was going to ask. So the first point on that was, do you want to be best in class? And then the follow up was, do you know what best in class looks like? I was just curious, why is that such a prevalent question? Why was that number one? Why? Why is that question so important to answer? Because I've seen a lot of manufacturers, even global uh, brands in factory levels or factory environments who've never even asked that question, but they just go about what they go about. I'm dealing with a company at the moment that does um, a huge amount of spreadsheet work. Mm. So they have an ERP system. They have five other systems that they bought and applied to solve a tactical issue in a, in a federated way. And the systems don't talk to each other. So in one of the interviews that I did for this readiness assessment for this client last week, he said, I come to work in the morning. I spend half my day logging on to six different systems with 10 digit passwords that sometimes I don't remember. I get, I then have to go to IT and get my password reset, which is a help desk ticket that doesn't happen over, you know, immediately. Yeah. Then I have to extract the data, possibly to a CSV file. I bring that into Excel, I mash it up. I put it into the format that I need it. I do a graph 
to show me that the needles were where it's meant to be. <laughs> wow. And there goes and there goes a half my day. Wow. That's not best in class. <laughs> that is highly inefficient and highly stressful. <laughs> And sadly, the modus operandi of many, many, many businesses. Wow. ERP and copious amounts of spreadsheets. Yeah. And when people come into an organisation that hasn't thought about doesn't want to be best in class, they simply accept the status quo. Yes. But I guess... This is the way it is. This is the way we've always done it. Uh, and that kind of leads to your point in the video, doesn't it? The grey haired ceiling, um, John, I guess, in terms of I, I really like that phrase, by the way. And I guess I've I've spoken about this in, in probably um, less, less uh, nice terms than that. <laughs> I really like that phrase. Um, yes, because I had young engineers coming up to me and saying, how do we get past you old blokes? Yeah. And I, guess and I said, well, if you can't go around, go through. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's exactly it, isn't it? It's about kind of driving that change from, from the ground up and, and having to push through those barriers. Yes, <laughs> short answer. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so John, uh, talk me through this one then. So, so how can a manufacturer fail with their digital transformation or their industry 4.0 transformation? How can they fail at it? So there's a fabulous... Um article based on research done by Cisco. It's dated May 2017. If your audience, or maybe you could put it in the comments below, but I'll try and find the link, but it's basically Cisco announced that three quarters of IOT projects are failing. Spectacular, <laughs> spectacular headline. And then you go and read their research, which I've summarized into some, you know, four slides that I put in, in one of my decks and, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. The primary reason is lack of collaboration between IT and OT. Yeah. Often organizations, IT is a barrier and it can be the tail wagging the dog. Um, but in organizations where IT and OT realize that they've got to kiss and make up and work together because they're from the same company. Um, and I believe that IT's role is to deliver stability while enabling innovation. It's, it's a two part role. They're yes. responsible for the infrastructure, the firewalls, the cyber security, the networks, you know, all that sort of stuff to make sure it's in place and adequate bandwidth. But they're also responsible for making sure that they don't get in the way of innovation. Um, that when some young gun who's a digital native wants to do some machine learning based on some production schedules to see whether there's opportunity to save money, they don't get in the way. They can actually support that idea through uh, rapid deployments of servers and things and therefore cloud computing you know, with organizations like Azure, Microsoft and AWS, give them the opportunity to do that. So it's, 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 the, it's, it's, not, it's not getting in the way and looking for opportunities to make those changes that are going to benefit the business in the longer term. And if you don't start now, it'd be like in the 1870s saying, oh, I don't like this electricity thing, it's newfangled and I'm gonna stick with steam. <laughs> yeah. It's, we're in the same place with Industry 4.0 and the fourth industrial revolution as we were back then. Um, and it's just a question of time. If you don't start now, you will be left behind. That's it. Yeah. I, I, and do you think, you know, as we hopefully pivot out of the kind of COVID issues and such, do you think there's a greater appetite from manufacturers to, to kind of make these changes now? Or do you think there's, you know, more reluctance or reticence to kind of action these, you know, investments? Um, they're looking, they're still confused. They generally don't know who to trust. Yeah. Often the responsibility for this transformation gets lumped on the desk of the operations manager level in an organization. And I don't know about the UK, but in Australia, I can say hand on heart, operations managers in manufacturing, particularly the food and beverage style industries or the FMCG or, you know, where there's paper mills and, you know, big stuff. Um, operations managers are the most time poor, leaned on, stressed out individuals that I work with. Yeah. So there's the last thing they want is a consulting house coming along and giving them more stuff to do. 
and 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 my role and my ambition is to change that and actually make the operations manager's life heap, heaps more easy by giving them the information they need when they need it in the form that they need it. Yeah. And I guess the, so they can now yeah. then start making decisions rather than um, looking at lag measures that are two weeks old and then going ghost chasing, which is a complete waste of time, only to find out that they don't know what happened anyway because people have short memory um, and they waste a lot of time doing that rather than improving the process. Yeah, it's an interesting one, John, because I was chatting to somebody last week who was who kind of, I guess, does a similar similar thing to yourself in terms of manufacturing advisory and, and, and that education for manufacturers on kind of improvement for industry 4.0, et cetera. And he was saying that one of the things he looks for is, is whether the manufacturing company, I guess, to assess their maturity and how ready they are for this change, is whether they're on their first, second, third, fourth operations leader, because the companies that are on their first one probably are not mature enough um, to kind of go down that route. You, you really need someone who's kind of, you know, been through the mill. They've, they've re re repurposed their vision. They've got dirty fingernails from, from really kind of getting into the nitty gritty of the operations. And I guess that, that kind of chimes with, with what you're saying as well. It does. And it also, when I mentioned before, there was the, you know, the seven step questionnaire where you are down the decision tree before you choose the platform. The other two things I quickly want to mention is the law of diffusion of innovation. It's a social science construct from the 1960s that's, that they learned how an idea travels through society. So right at the bull nose of the, of the bell curve of, of adoption, uh, you have the innovators and they take up two and a half percent of the bell curve. Close and behind them are the early adopters, which take up the next 13 and a half percent. So between the innovators and the early adopters, you have 16 percent. It's only when you get to 16 percent that you reach what Malcolm Gladwell called the tipping point. And then the idea starts to travel through the early majority, 34 percent, the late majority, 34 percent, and the laggards, the skeptics, it'll never work, bringing up the rear. If you're an organisation that's the early majority or late majority, forget it. You've got to wait for the innovators and early adopters to get in first. And I recently heard that in Germany, Siemens have estimated, the home of Industry 4.0, Siemens have estimated that less than 4% of German manufacturing industry has adopted Industry 4 at all. Wow. So, so they're just past the innovation 2.5%. In Australia, we're still in the 2.5%. We haven't even got to the early adopter phase yet. Now, that's wow. good and bad. <laughs> good in that, well, bad in that we're being left behind by the rest of the world, but good that in our local market, the early adopter competitive advantage is there for the taking. Yes. So if you assess your organisation based on its appetite for risk and you're in that front end, that, that 16%, happy days. So you've done your seven questions and you know what you've got to do. You now look at where you're at in that social science construct and in that early adopter innovator bullnose. The third uh, question to ask yourself is where are you on the hierarchy of competence? If yeah. your organisation is unconsciously incompetent, it doesn't know it doesn't know, that's an issue. I get all of my work from organisations that transcend that barrier themselves and step into consciously incompetent. Yeah. They now know they don't know and they go looking for help. And that's my ideal client. Yeah, the known unknowns. <laughs> yeah, well, now they know they don't know. And then they become conscious. So the systems and processes and strategies get put in place. So now they know they know, yes. which is conscious competence. And then eventually they just get used to doing what they do. They become unconsciously competent. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess that that's, I'm going to re-listen to this a couple of times, John, to, to fully digest and absorb what you said there, because um, a lot of knowledge bombs being dropped. And I think that's really interesting for companies to start getting a bit more of a handle on kind of where they are on that bell curve, definitely. Well, think about it, you know, in summary, uh, Dan, it's, it's like this. If you're an organization that wants to be best in class, think you know what that looks like and has the executive commitment and leadership to do so, you're not risk averse and you would position yourself in the innovator early adopter mindset and you know you don't know but you want to know and you're prepared to go out and get the outside help and support 
absolute sweet spot. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. John, no, I, we're getting towards the end of the episode now, and I just wanted to kind of, you know, I appreciate we haven't got a crystal ball here, but but what do you think the next kind of five, 10 years looks like for manufacturers now, given everything we've discussed um, across the last half an hour or so? Um, like all convergences like this, there will be disruption. Yeah. Some yeah. will see this disruption as a headwind, too hard, head in the sand, don't want to know, I'm, I'm 55 years of age and I'm in a production manager's or an operations manager's role, I'm just going to coast to retirement. Um, and, and there'll be those that are the younger, more dynamic that see it as a tailwind yeah. and they'll go, wow, look at the opportunity we have that's right in front of us. Let's start doing some proof of value pilots. Let's start exploring machine learning, AI, even just connecting stuff and putting data in an unstructured data lake in the cloud. Let's see what we can do with that and, and do what they call horizon one, two, and three thinking where horizon three is the next three to five years. Where do we want to be as a business in 2027? We come to work. What do we see in a manufacturing environment? We have dashboards. They're real time. What do they show us? What's the situational awareness? How do I know when I come to work and I look at the dashboard and I've got four green dials and one red dial? Oh, that's what I've got to work on today. That's the problem I have to solve. It's about brokering and giving the people at those levels the right information in a way that they can consume it and then supporting them to get the information they need underneath that to try and do some root cause. And I see that as a great opportunity. And I, I think we'll see a split in the marketplace. We'll see a shakeout and, and, the, and the skeptics and the laggards will fall by the wayside or they'll just continue to do what they do badly, um, but they'll lose market share and someone will, you know, cut their lunch. Yeah. I, I think this has been a, a really interesting episode, John. And and I think from my perspective, I've learned tons. You know, you're labeled as you know, an industry 4.0 educator, a smart factory specialist. And I think everything you've mentioned today will, will add real good value to the listenership. So really appreciate you joining me on the pod, John. Um, for everybody listening, I've, uh, I'm have i going to include the links to John's videos in the comments below, links to John's profile. So, you know, get in touch with John and, and have a have a listen to, to what he's got to say. But um, I really appreciate your time, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Much appreciated. And uh, catch you later. Yeah, sounds good. Cheers.